Yes, yes, me too, amen. Awesome. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, James chapter 2 this morning, James chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 26. Thank you so much, worship team, for just your diligence and your faithfulness each and every week to hear from the Lord and to be led by the Lord to, to just bring us into this place of worship. Thank you, uh, everybody in the back that uh, runs the projectors, the sound, and the lights. And uh, it takes all of us to be a part to see God do the work that he wants to do. And uh, it's faith in action, and that's what I want us to be looking at this morning. That's the title of this message, Faith in Action. This past week, I was, uh, Wednesday, I was, or Tuesday, I was at a gathering of local pastors, and uh, when pastors get together, they like to eat, so I wasn't too upset about that. And uh, whenever there's a buffet involved, it's even better. Uh, but uh, we got together, and we were just discussing different things, and just kind of a fellowship meeting with pastors in, in Altoona, in the region here. And, and as we were there, one of the pastors asked a question to all of us and said, he said, pastors, what do you think the greatest danger facing the church in 2020 will be? What do you think the greatest danger facing the church in 2020 is going to be? Let me give you some of the responses. Uh, I wrote these down because I'm always interested in thinking and knowing what other pastors think. Uh, one pastor said, we're battling against the forces of darkness and the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's true. We're in a spiritual battle. This battle we're in is not a physical battle, it's a spiritual battle. Another one said we're facing the danger of uh, increasing moral breakdown of our culture. They said in 2020 they, they just see such a moral decline within, the, within culture and within the church that it's going to be probably one of the, the greatest things we have to face. Another one said nobody ever wants to commit to anything anymore. Everybody just wants to be, and these were his words, everybody just wants to be a free spirit. They just want to come and go and do what they want, when they want. And, and it's very hard as a pastor, it's very hard as leadership to, to count on people within the church anymore. Because people are just saying, well, I'll do this if I feel like doing it. And some discussion went on and some different thoughts were, were shared. And then I kind of piped in and I said, honestly, I think the, the greatest danger facing the church today and also facing the church in the future is this. I believe the greatest danger for the church the church of Jesus Christ, the true bride of Christ, the greatest danger is this, is that we become a church of lip service and not of action. Where we confess to knowing Jesus, but there isn't a chance that the world around us even has a clue that we're followers of Christ. I think the greatest danger to the church is what we're going to see here this morning in James chapter 2 is this, is that we say we have faith, we say that we believe in Jesus, we come to church on Sunday morning, we can sing all the worship songs, man, we might even play the songs on our, on our radio as we're, as we're driving down the street, and, and it sounds and it looks good, and we sound the part, but the problem is, is there's nothing behind us, there's nothing backing up what our words are saying. Millions of people are professing Christ today. Thousands of people all across the world will be baptized today. Some will be confirmed, and, and there'll, there'll be people all over the world that become members of a church. And yet I would dare say that many of them, not all of them, but many of them don't even really understand what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Because they don't attempt to live that life outside of the church. They put on the, the mask, they, they come into church, and they, they, they display what they think everybody wants to see. But when they go out into the world, there's a hard, hard line to say, are they really a Christian? They don't desire to live that pure and righteous life. They don't give all that they have to, to reach the lost. They, they don't give all that they are to, to meet the needs of the world, let alone to even reach into their own city, into their own backyards. So the question then becomes, are they even really saved? Do they really have a genuine faith? We've come to a day in our society when people will say, oh, I believe in God. I believe in God. And, and it's thrown out, especially within the political realms, oh, I believe in God. I believe that God exists. And it's okay to say that we believe that God exists, but it means absolutely nothing to simply believe that God is there. I said it last week, the demons believe <laughs> but they don't know him. 
They don't have a relationship with him. And so we have to understand, we have to look at this and understand that God desires for us not just to simply give lip service to him and say, I am a follower of Christ, and then not have anything behind it, but to actually live it out. This is what I want us to tackle this morning in this message. Do you and I possess a faith that is evidenced by action? Do you and I possess a faith that is evidenced by action? Look, if you would, James chapter 2, beginning with verse number 14. James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. We sing that song, I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. Why are we a friend of God? Well, it's right here because we should be displaying righteousness. We should be displaying our faith and actions. Verse 24, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Again, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works, without deeds, is dead also. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works, faith without deeds, is dead also. Father, I thank you for your word. Mm. May it just penetrate into our hearts this morning. May we shut out the distractions, and may we focus in on you this morning. Because, Lord, in the end, we answer to one and one only, and that's you. So may your word come alive this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe there are two questions that every believer needs to ask himself. Two questions that we need to confront and face in our daily lives. And this is, number one, can a man have faith and not do good works? Can a man have faith and not do good works? And number two is this, can faith without good works save a man? Can a man have faith and not do good works? And can faith without good works save a man? The answer to both of those questions is an emphatic no. It is impossible to have faith and not have good works. And on the other hand, it is impossible to do good works and claim to have faith. A person who really believes something does something. He acts upon it. Many of you are, are, are sports fans of one team or another. If you're a, a, a Dallas Cowboy fan, we pray for you each and every week here at this church. But still, if you're a Dallas Cowboy fan, what do you, you go out and you buy Dallas Cowboy stuff because you are putting your belief that Dallas is your favorite team into action. For you Steeler fans, you go out and you, you buy Steeler stuff and you wear it. Why? Because you're putting that belief that that's your team into action and you want people to see that that is what it is. Some of you, you know, in other areas of your life, you know, you have this value. You see something like, man, I'm really for that. And so you go out and you purchase it. You buy it. And it becomes a part of your life. And this is what we see here with this passage of Scripture. It's saying that we can't just proclaim it and then do nothing about it. I can't just say, hey, I'm a Steelers fan and never watch a game, never buy a product, never even care what the score is. But yet that's what people do when they say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I have faith, but yet they have nothing to back it up. Millions of people profess faith in Christ and belong to the church, yet they don't live for Christ. They live for the world and for self. 
You see, the only difference between their lives and unbelievers is that they sometimes get up and come to church on Sunday mornings. The only difference between them and the world is that sometimes they'll offer up a prayer and say, Lord, help me through this day. You see, we can profess faith, but if there's nothing behind it, is faith really alive in our lives? There's little, if any, difference between their behavior and their speech during the week. There's two distinctions that we see here. Verse 14, it says, The man says he has faith, but it is only what he says. I have faith. I have faith. I have faith. I believe. I believe. I believe. We can say that over and over and over and over again, and that's what verse 14 says. The man says, I have faith, but he does nothing to show that he really believes in Jesus Christ. I hope and pray this morning that each and every one of us here this morning would say, I have faith. I have faith. I have faith. But beyond that, are you living it in your life? Are you showing that you have that faith? You can talk the talk, but are you walking the walk? You see this Bible, the verse here says he's not living for Christ. He's not living a righteous and godly life in this world. He's just kind of out there doing his own thing. His faith is only a faith of speech, not of behavior and life. His faith is only a faith of profession, but not of possession. Let me say that again. This person has a faith of profession, but not a possession. They can profess Christ, but they don't possess Christ in their life. Kind of like I was saying earlier as we were worshiping and as we were singing that song uh, uh, about the altar, come to the altar. Man, you can go to the altar of your heart and bow before the Lord right there if you possess him, if you truly have a relationship with him. His faith is only a faith of word, not of works. Three times in this passage, James says that this kind of faith is dead. This kind of faith is dead. Look at verse 17. It says, thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 20, a foolish man that had faith without works is dead. Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. It's one thing to say you have it, but it's another thing to exhibit it. Faith without works is dead. Verse 14 tells us that this kind of faith is worthless. It's unprofitable for anything. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, it says that we call it a vain and an empty faith. Don't just say, I believe. Don't just say, I know God's there. What's the point? What, what, What any good do you get out of just proclaiming that God is there? If you're not living like God is there, then there is no point behind it. And Corinthians says it's a vain, it's an empty faith. Nothing to back it up. In other words, it's a Christless faith. It's not enough to claim that we have faith and not live for Christ. Church, we need to believe that Christ really died for us. We need to believe Christ really, really believe that he is the Savior and the Lord of your life. We need to believe that he paid the price for us, not just to to say, oh, look at that. He did something neat, cool. I'm coming to church on Easter. No, no, no. It's to believe every day that he did something for us and to live it out in our lives. Not just simply giving him lip service and saying we believe. Church, if we really believe, we will do what Christ says. We will live for Christ, and we will do the works that please him. If you really believe God's word, if you really believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you will do the works that please Christ. Now, you have to understand this. You're not going to just do works for the sake of doing works. You're not going to say, well, I'm going to go this, I'm going to do that. No, it says, you will do the works for Christ's sake. Scripture says, whatever a man finds to do, let him do it with all of his might, with all of his power, with all that is in him to the glory of God. So when you go out and you're you're doing works, you're not just doing it to bring attention to yourself. Hey, look at me. I'm doing all these works. Woohoo! I mean, I'm a good guy. No, we do them as unto the Lord. We live a Christ-centered life. I love how James doesn't just throw the thought out there, but he actually gives us an example of what he's talking about. Look at verses 15 through 17. The English Standard Version puts it this way. It says, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the thing that they need for the body, what good is it? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That's kind of like James just like, here, give me your toes and stomping right on them. How many times have we been guilty of saying, oh, I'm praying for you. 
When somebody tells us of a need, when they tell us of a struggle, we're like, oh, okay, I'm praying for you. Go and be well. James is saying, what good is it if we say we have faith and we don't do anything to help meet the needs of a brother or sister? What good is it if we, we know of a need and we're just like, okay, good luck with that? Because that's basically, honestly, that's what you're saying. We say, okay, I'm praying for you. Good luck with that. Sister Jack and Shirley, what they say? Well, bless your heart. That's the southern way of saying, good luck with that. <laughs> But we do that so many times in our life because we just don't want to be stuck with that. But James is saying, hey, shame on you. If you know that a need can be met and you know that you can help meet that need, then you better be about doing it. The example is dealing with believers, brothers and sisters in the Lord, it, 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 not with those that don't profess a faith. It's, it's our family, our church family, meeting the needs of those that are here. Brother or sister faces some need or problem that makes him destitutes. They're unable to properly take care of things in their life. They can't stay warm or they're having a difficult time with food. If we know that and we do nothing, James is saying, your faith is dead. Your faith is dead. Why do we have a wood ministry? Because there are people that through the wintertime, they may struggle. They may have a need to just keep their house warm. And so we say, hey, we'll provide the wood. We have the gas ministry that, that, you know, we can help provide gas for people and, and it helps meet a need at, at a reduced rate. And, and we have the tax ministry and, and 800 this past year, we're 800. And uh, we're hoping for 1,000 this coming year, free tax ministry, just a donation. Why? Because we believe in helping meet the need of people that may not be able to meet those needs in other ways. You see, we believe that as a church, we have to be a church in action as well. Not just to say we believe, but to actually do things. And so we have to do it as a church, and we have to do it as individuals. Listen to this. True faith loves and cares, and is compassionate and reaches out to help those in need. True faith loves, and true faith cares. True faith is compassionate, and it reaches out to help those in need. You can talk all you want about believing in Jesus Christ. You can talk until you're blue in the face, but if you're not reaching out to help those in need like Jesus himself did, then your talk is utterly meaningless. It goes back to what I said last week. Sometimes you need to stop the lips from flapping. Stop this. Da, 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 da. And to put it this way, put up or shut up. It's time to put up for Christ. It's time to live the life for Christ or just keep your mouth shut. Because there are too many people that are saying they're Christians and they're more of an embarrassment for the church than they are a light for Christ. We need to live our life to bring honor and glory to him. It's time that we are a church in action, that we are believers that step out and do what God desires. There are a lot of people that can tell you, hey, I'm a great Christian, I'm a great Christian, I'm a great Christian, but then if you follow me, like, you're not even a Christian at all because they're not living the life. They can quickly tell you how good of a Christian they are and how bad of a person you are. Well, I do this, and I do this, and I do this, but what about you? But it's all lip service. No person really believes in Jesus Christ unless he is following after Christ, unless he is doing the work and the love out of righteousness for him. True faith is an active force, a faith that changes things. True faith is an active force. When you have faith, it will force you, it will cause you to do something. It won't allow you just to sit back. If you have a true relationship with Jesus Christ, it's going to cause you, the Holy Spirit's going to propel you into situations, into places where you can be used, where you can bring honor and glory to God. It's not just going to say, well, yeah, you got faith, don't do anything. True faith propels you forward to do something for him because true faith changes things. True faith changes things. We are a church that believes that God is on the throne, that God is still a miracle-working God. We believe that God provides, that God meets our needs. And if you just sit back and say, well, I hope it happens, and don't do your part and say, I'm going to honor the Lord with my tithe. I'm going to honor the Lord by, by honoring my father and mother. I'm going to honor the Lord by, by remembering the Sabbath to keep it holy. I'm going to honor God with this and with that. Then, then you shouldn't expect for those blessings. But God says, when you are faithful, when you act on them, God in return will be faithful to you because faith changes things. I've seen people that have been sick. I've been see, seen people that have had the worst diagnosis over their life. Doctors said there's no chance. 
And you know what happens? People of faith, people that believe that God is able, come together and they begin to pray. Sometimes it's over, over weeks, sometimes it's over months, sometimes they walk into a hospital room, and, and I've witnessed this where somebody has walked into a hospital room, the diagnosis has been dire, and they pray for that person, and within minutes, they get up and they're like, what's wrong? And the doctor's like, I don't know, what, I can't explain it, they're, they're dead to rights. But God, and because people of faith prayed and believed, God steps in and God moves. You see, that's faith that changes things. But if you're living a life that just says, well, maybe, maybe not, then how can you expect for faith to change things? True faith says we will take all that we are and have beyond our own needs. We'll give it to meet the needs of our destitute brothers and sisters throughout the world. In verse 18, James is painting the picture of two men, but only one man speaks, and what he says is only the sentence. There's only one sentence. The man says to the other man, you have faith. And I have works. The man that thinks he has faith believes that he is saved by faith, that God accepts him because he believes in Jesus Christ, even if he fails to live for Christ. He says, I believe in Christ. I professed him. I've been baptized. I've joined the church. So that means that God has accepted me and I'll make it to heaven someday. But is this man truly saved? To answer that question, don't listen to me. And what I think about it, let's go to God's word. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. These are the words of Jesus. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not just saying, Lord, Lord, I believe is going to get you there. Lord, I believe, and I'm going to follow through with what I believe. Mark 7, 6, Jesus said to them, <clears throat> well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Are you just giving God lip service? I believe. Lip service isn't good enough. Where is the heart? Is your heart following hard after God? Is your heart seeking after him? Is your heart saying, I'm going to do, I'm going to live righteously for him? Over in Titus chapter 1, Paul writes this to Titus in verse 10 and 16. He says, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. I love how the English standard puts that. They are empty talkers. They just go on and on and on and on and on and on. And you're just saying, what in the world are you even talking about? They're empty talkers. They're deceivers. There, there are many out there that will talk and talk to deceive the church today. Verse 16 says, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. The Bible says in the last days, many people will be led astray, that, that false prophets, false teachers will rise up and, and people will just, they'll gravitate toward them because, oh man, that sounds so good. Oh, listen to what they're saying. And, and they'll lead people astray because they're just babbling nonsense. They're babbling uh, the, the empty talkers that will deceive. So we have to hold true and fast to the word of God to know what is true, to know what is right, so we don't fall into that aspect of just hearing and not doing. First guy in James 2 claims to have faith and to know the second one claims to have works. He claims that God accepts him because he does good works. He lives a good life as much as he possibly can. He believes that the important thing to God is to be righteous and to do all the good that a person can do. If a person does this, God will never reject him. If a person does that, then he's in good standing with God. God will accept him no matter who he is, no matter what religion he follows. Because, hey, I'm a good person. Look what I do. And that's the world we live in today. So many people say that they don't need a Savior. I don't need a Savior because I can just do good things. I can go out and I can be a good person. I can do this and I can do that. And people will look and say, oh, they're a good person. And if there is a heaven... They say, if there is, then my good works will get me in there. Look at me. I don't get drunk like they do. I don't do drugs like they do. Oh, I, I don't run to the places that they do. I've been faithful to, to my spouse. And, and, and they'll say, I do all these good things trying to prove that I am fit for the kingdom of heaven. The problem with that is this. We can never be good enough. You can never do enough good works to be fit for heaven. Never, ever, because the Bible says that sin separates us from God. 
And if that sin has come in, if we think that all my good works can get me to heaven, then friend, you're sadly mistaken. Because you are not God. You are not your own Savior. God sent his son to die on the cross to forgive you of your sins, to set you free from even that mindset that my good works will be enough. If a life of good works isn't enough to get you to heaven, then what is? Look at Matthew chapter 7, 22. Jesus again speaking. He says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Lord, didn't we do mighty works in your name? Many on that day will say, Lord, why can't I get into heaven? Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I tell people about things that were going to happen in, in your name? Lord, didn't I, didn't I uh, cast out the demons in your name? Didn't I do many good things and say it was because of God's? You see, many people will say they're doing it for God's glory. They'll proclaim that they're doing it for his name. And yet they're doing it for selfish gain. They're doing it for the attention on themselves. They're not doing it to honor God's. And the way we know this is because they're always trying to puff themselves up rather than to just simply declare what God says and allow for the Spirit of God to work. They want the attention rather than giving the glory to God. And we have to be careful that we don't allow for this to, to sneak into, into our presence, into our church, into our lives. We have to be careful that we're not just prophesying, that we're not just casting out demons, that we're not just doing works for the sake of, of doing it. We have to be intentional in knowing that we're honoring God and that we're declaring that he alone is faithful, that he alone is the one that is doing the works in and through us. Not by our power, not by our might, but by his strength and his might. James handles both men of arrogance with one clear statement. He says this. He doesn't pull any punches here. He says, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Show me your faith without works. Can't be done. It's impossible to happen. And I will show you my faith by my works. Church, a person that truly believes in Christ works for Christ. If you believe in Jesus, you're going to work for Jesus. If you believe in the Lord, you're going to work for the Lord. If you believe and are truly a follower, then you're going to say, I'm going to do what he desires for me to do. I'm going to let my light be lived out in the world. I'm not just going to keep it hidden in, a, in, in, in the church on Sunday morning, but no, I'm going to take it everywhere I go. I'm going to do the works that my Father has for me. A person who only professes Christ lives for himself, going about doing just simply what he wants to do, when he wants to do it. He doesn't live a life of separation from the world doesn't live a life of righteousness, a life of purity. He doesn't give what the Lord has blessed him with to meet the desperate needs that somebody else may have. James is saying that many profess Christ, but they live for the pleasure and the things of that day and of that time. Think about it. What new thing is on the market that's being advertised, that's sucking you in going, yeah, I need to have that. Ooh, I can't live without that. See, the world entices us with its pleasures. It pulls us in. Can I just tell you, I'm sick and tired of you people, and it's probably half of this congregation, that are all about the pumpkin spice. <laughs> like, five, six years ago, who knew pumpkin spice was a thing? But media, Starbucks, uh, if you drink that stuff from Dunkin' Donuts, you know, it, whatever. Everybody has pumpkin spice this, pumpkin spice that. And we're like, oh, I gotta have pumpkin spice. It was a fall thing, like maybe in October. Now it's like August, and it's like, I need my pumpkin spice. Why? Because we've been programmed over a period of time to say, you have to have this in your life. And so what do we do? We replace the programming of God's word that says, this is what you need in your life to the programming of the world that says this is what you need in your life. Instead of going after all that God has for us, we start going after all the things in the world. Now listen, if you like your pumpkin spice, God bless you. 
enjoy it. I'm thankful it's only around for a short period of time. (laughs) But you see, this is around forever. God's word doesn't cease to exist because we think it should, because the season isn't right. No, God's word is always readily available. God's word is always true. It says the instant in season and out of season to give an account for what you believe. James tells us it is faith and works, not either or, that is important. It's faith and works together, combined. Not either or. It's not faith or works, or works or faith, but together it's important. Look again, Matthew 16, 516, Jesus speaking again. Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, And give glory to your Father, which is in heaven. Again, in the same way, let your light shine before others. In other words, get out and do something for God. Let your light, let the light of Christ that's inside of you, let it shine for the world to see so that they can see your good works, so that they'll see what you're doing, that you're honoring God, that you're being faithful, that you're being pure, that you're being righteous. So why? So that it'll bring glory to the Father. It doesn't say that it will puff you up, that it will bring glory to you, that you'll get a pat on the back, that a boy, that a boy, good job, way to go. No, it says that God will receive the glory. Because if you're going out looking for the glory for yourself, you're going to be disappointed over and over and over again. You can give all of your life to trying to impress people by who you are. And if you're doing it to impress people by who you are, then friends, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. We go out and let our light shine for Christ. 1 Peter 2, 12. New century version says, people who do not believe are living all around you, and they might say that you are doing wrong. Live such good lives that they will see the good things you do, and they will do and give glory to God on the day when Christ comes again. Again, live such good lives that they will see the good things that you do. If you say you believe in Jesus Christ, then live it so they can say, man, I see it in their life. And again, why? So that it will give glory to God. That they will be able to stand before the Lord someday. And this is so important. And I want you to understand this this morning. He's saying that, Peter is saying that when they stand before God, they will be able to stand before God and say, God, it was because of so-and-so from new life that I watched their life, that I followed their life, that I was intrigued by their life. I saw how they lived their life. It was because of how they lived their life that it brought me into believing and into a relationship with you. And that's why I'm here today. So that they will give glory to God on that day. Is your life being lived out so that somebody someday will stand before God and say, because of so-and-so and how they live their life, I'm here today. James closes out this passage with one final point on faith and works. And then he'll drive it home with two examples, verse 19 through 20. He's calling out those who would consider themselves to be religious. He says, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? James is saying a true man of religion believes in one God. He's neither an atheist nor an agnostic. He is a believer. James even says that his belief in God is said to be a good thing. Oh, you say you believe in God? Good, good for you. The man does well to believe, James says. But then James declares that simply believing isn't good enough. John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus says, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. James tells us to consider the demons, the evil spirits. They believe in God. They know God exists. They even believe in the deity of Christ. But demons aren't saved. They don't follow after Christ. Their belief has not affected their lives. Their belief certainly hasn't affected their behavior. They believe, oh yeah, Jesus is there. And and the demons believe, but yet they have no relationship. A faith that doesn't change the way we behave is a dead faith. 
Last thing I want you to see here, a faith that doesn't change the way we behave is a dead faith. It's not up to you to clean up your life, and then God will accept you. Hear me again. It's not up to you to clean up your life and then say, okay, God, I'm ready for you to accept me. No, it's up to you to believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior. Give him all of your junk, give him all of your problems, give him all of your life, and then allow for his work. Allow for the work of his regeneration to take place in you. Allow for him to create in you a clean heart. Allow for him to to make you a new creation. Let him grow good fruit inside of you instead of the poison that you've been living in. You don't have to clean up your act to come to Christ. You come to Christ and then you let him clean up your act. Because you say, I'm going to follow you. And as you follow me, begin to do the things that God desires for you to do. Look at these two examples as we close. James chapter 2, verse 21 through 24. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. Abraham offers his son Isaac as a sacrifice, and it says he was doing both. His faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. The scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. James is saying that Abraham proved that he was justified by what he did. He was justified by his works. Abraham's faith was proven to be true. It was proven to be a living faith because of what he did by offering his son. James says that Abraham's faith actually fashioned, or Abraham's faith actually worked with. Abraham's faith was in conjunction with. It it, it was, uh, Abraham's faith cooperated with his works. They weren't separate. They were together. His works made Abraham's faith perfect and complete. A true and living faith is not one that just sits idly by. A true and living faith goes to work. A true and living faith completes and finishes its course. If Abraham said, okay, Isaac, we're going to go up to the mountain and we're going to sacrifice, you know, load up the sticks, load up the the, the fire, let's get ready, let's go up. And and he got up there and Abraham knew that the only way that he could honor God was by offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice. But he gets up there and he says, okay, this is it. We're going to do it right now. But then all of a sudden he says, you know what? I'm not sure about this God. There has to be another way. Let me find an animal instead of my son. He would have been walking out of that faith. He would have not had faith in action. He would not have had faith with works. But instead he says, okay, God, I'm going to honor you. I know that you have promised. And I know that your promises are true. So he stepped out in that faith. He proved that he was justified by what he did. Faith. Faith must be alive. It must be active. If faith doesn't work or act or complete or finish its course, it is a dead faith. It's incomplete. It's unproven. Abraham's faith fulfilled scripture, Genesis 15, 6. It says, Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Abraham, you're righteous, not just because you know me, but because you have faith in action. Because of your faith, I count you as righteous. These words were declared some 30 years before Abraham even offered up his son Isaac. James is pointing out that when Abraham offered up Isaac, he was proving his faith. The reason Abraham offered up Isaac was because he did believe God. He did believe God's promises. He didn't have to question. He said, I am acting out of faith and I'm offering up my son because I know that God will be faithful. If a person doesn't believe Christ, he doesn't do what Christ says. He just keeps on doing his own thing over and over and over. He he doesn't follow after Christ. But true faith is a living and an active faith. It is a faith that proves itself by living for Christ and by working for Christ. I find it rather amusing and pretty amazing that the last example that James gives is of Rahab, the prostitute, who provided her faith by her works. Look at verse 25 and 26. James chapter 2, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone? In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? 
Why in the world would James go from Abraham, the father of our faith, one of the, the, the pillars of our faith, to Rahab, a prostitute? Why would he use this, this incredibly godly man compared to this woman that people would look at and despise and say, oh, just discard her, put her away? Why? Why does he compare the two? It's because when God looks down, he looks at our heart, he looks at our life, and he says, it doesn't matter how long you lived for me, it doesn't matter how much you say you declare that you know me, what matters is, are you truly living for me? Have you given your life over to me? And if you know the story of Rahab, the, the, Israel sent these two messengers in, these two spies into the land to, to scope things out, and if they were found out to be there, they'd have been put to death for sure, and, and if Rahab would have been found to be harboring them, she would have been certainly put to death. But she says this. She says this to the the two spies. I have come to the understanding. I have come to the knowledge. I have come to the to the to, to, to grips with this that your God is the true God. And because your God is the true God and your God has a plan for your people, I will not allow for you to be captured. And because of that, my works are gonna lead you out the back way to set you free. God can use even the person that we think is the most vilest, the most, the most worthless, the, the person that eh, nobody's going to look at. And if we say, Lord, I believe in you. I believe that you're God. I believe that you sent your son Jesus Christ to die for me. And because I believe that, now I'm going to start to live it. You see, that's what it's saying here. She believed that God was the God of Israel. She believed that he was the one true God. And she said, now because of that, I'm going to live it. Church, her story is amazing. It's, it's only, not only a story that, that, that is used in this passage, but it's a story that talks about how God can take each and every one of us and use us. Why would she betray her country? Because she wanted to honor God. Look at what it says, Joshua 2, 9, 11. I know that the Lord has given you this land. She's declaring the promises of God. God promised that land to Israel. And she says, I know that God has given you this land. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. She believed in God, therefore she acted. She put her faith to work. Don't just sit there and say, I believe and do nothing about it. James concludes verse 26 with this observation. For the body without the spirit is dead. So faith without works, is dead also. A body without the spirit, without the spirit of breath, is dead. A body without breath doesn't move, it doesn't act, it doesn't live, it doesn't work. It's empty. The body's just, it's a dead body. It's exactly the same way with our faith. James is saying faith without works is dead. It doesn't move, it doesn't act, it doesn't live, it doesn't work. Faith without work is empty, totally useless, worthless. It doesn't live for Christ, doesn't follow him in righteousness or purity, doesn't follow him in his works to reach people, doesn't follow him to meet the needs of a destitute world. It's dead. James isn't talking about a person being saved and doing good works. He's saying that if we are saved, we will do good works. If we do believe, we will follow him. According to Ephesians, it is why God saved us. Ephesians 2.8, most of us have heard this passage one time or another, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is God's grace through faith that we're saved. We're saved. And this is not your own doing, but it is the gift of God. Not a result of works. You haven't done it. You haven't earned it. You haven't worked for it. So that no one may boast. Look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. It's so important here. We are his workmanship. You have been created. You have been created in Christ. You are a new creation. So Christ has created you for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's not just enough to say, I believe, I have faith. It says here, we have to have faith in action. Why? Because God created us for good works. God created you for good works. He has prepared for you in advance. God has laid up for you beforehand good works that he has for you to do. 
and only you can do them. It's not up to somebody else to perform your good works. It's up to you to perform your good works of righteousness. It's up to you to do that. Not all of you can get up here and sing on the platform and make a, 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 a harmonious sound. Some of you would just make a joyful noise and it wouldn't be so joyful for some of us. But God has created for good works those that are up here. But it doesn't mean you're left out of it because it means that you were created for corporate worship. You were created to, to help be a part of lifting up and praising and worshiping together, making the joyful noise unto the Lord. You were created to work in the kids' ministry, to work in the youth ministry, to, 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 to drive the bus, to, to, to work in the sound ministry. You were created to be a greeter. You were created, the Bible even says, God has, has given the gift of, uh, of wealth. He's given the gift so that people can use their knowledge and wisdom and finances to help be a blessing to others. What are you doing with what God has given you? Are you just saying you believe, or are you acting upon that belief? Faith without works is dead. It's dead. Now I said earlier that uh, we're going to take some time around the altar, and, and this is why I did it the way we did it earlier. Worship team, you can come on up. For some of us here this morning, for a lot of us here this morning, it may have been a challenge. It may have been difficult to restrain ourselves, to, to not go to the altar during the praise and worship time. It, was, it was, may have been hard because we're used to that. We love to come to the altar. We love to, to spend that time. In the, and, and it may have been a challenge. It may have been difficult. But I want you to know this, that the altar of God is always open. But God says, I desire for those that come to the altar not just to come and give lip service, but I want them to come to the altar so that I can do a work in them and that they can go out and do good works that honor me. See, the altar is a holy place. It's a place where we come. It's a place where we, we, we encounter the resurrected Savior. It's a place where we lay down our burdens. We lay down our cares. It's a place where we come and we, we can do some business with God in a sense. The altar is also a place of worship. It's a place of praise. It's a place to recognize that God has paid the ultimate price through his son, Jesus Christ. The altar is so much. When Israel would win a victory, they'd win a battle, an altar would be erected and they'd give thanks to God. See, sometimes I think we get into this mindset that the altar is only a place where we come and dump stuff. Oh, we can come and we can bring our sin, we can bring our cares and our burdens, yes, to the altar. In the Old Testament, they were burned up as a sign of our sins being forgiven. But you see, more times than not, the altar was erected and sacrifices were offered up to thank God, to give glory to Him. Say, Lord, you're amazing. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for being the one who paid that price. Thank you for seeing me through this. And so we're going to close this service, and, and I just want us to, to just kind of have that attitude, have that atmosphere that, Lord, my desire is not that I would just give you lip service, not that I would just proclaim you with my mouth that I believe, but, Lord, that you would give me action to what I believe that I would have a faith with works and that it would be evident that others would see, that others would know. And so this morning, as we kind of bring this time to an end, I want us to do it in a sense where we're, we're saying, okay, God, it's not all about me. It's not about what I think, but it's surrendering it all to you, giving my life and saying, I want you to accomplish what you can because you have created good works beforehand for me to live for you for me to serve you for me to honor you can we stand this morning and I want to encourage you I want to encourage us to just come and please just understand the altar is a place that they would all gather around 
to give thanks to the Lord. Because it represented his presence was there to pay for their sin. It represented that his presence was there to honor and say, yes, we've trusted in God. We're going to sing this song, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask uh, for my elder board, uh, Jim, Scott, Tom, Ed. Bobby, you can stay there. I'm going to ask for you guys if you would come and uh, just kind of stand here in the, in the front over on this side for me. And uh, the Bible says to call upon the elders if you have a need, and they'll pray for you. And so if you have a physical need, if you have a, a need that you're facing this morning, as we take this time around the altar, they're going to be over here on the right, and they just want to take time to pray with you and to encourage you and to, to, sit, to, to put that faith in action. Because somebody need to take a step of faith out of where you're at and do, bring it to a point of action where you're saying, I give it to you, God, for you to do the work. So guys, would you come on up? Board members, come on up over here. And then for the rest of us, we're just going to gather around this altar. And we're going to sing this song. It simply says, reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. Reach out and touch the Lord. Because so many times we get so fast, we get so moved, we don't even see the Lord passing by. And he's there each and every moment, every part, every day of our life. So this morning, if you have a need, these gentlemen are here. They'll pray with you. If you want to come, just fill these altars right now as we sing this song, as we declare it to him this morning. Let's just make this a time where it's between us and the Lord this morning. Reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. You'll find he's not too busy to No rush, no hurry, but just to touch him. Reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. You'll find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. Oh, he is passing by this moment. Your here at the altar. Lord, we're here, Lord God, just making this a time between us and you, Lord God. Lord, we need you to, 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 to display the works that you want us to do. Lord, that we would not sit idly by and just be simply hearers, but Father, we would step out, that we would be doers of the word, doers of the work that you want us to do. Lord, our life is but a vapor, here today and gone tomorrow. Lord, what are we doing with that life? Are we just saying we believe? Or, Father, are we living it? Are we living it? Oh, Father, we thank you, Jesus. Oh, here at the altar, Lord God, here in this place, do the work that only you can do, Jesus. Pour out your spirit upon your church. Pour out your spirit upon your church, Lord, like never before. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, we, we desire your presence that our life might be a light that is shined before this world. Oh, Lord, that you would move in a mighty and a powerful way. Oh, here in this place, here at this altar, here at this altar, Lord, in your presence, Lord Jesus. Oh, in your presence, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. We surrender it all to you. 
all to you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Holy is your name, Lord. Touch, Lord God, in a mighty way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, in this place, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified. Be glorified. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Lord, you paid the price on the cross of Calvary. Lord, you set the captive free. And Lord, those who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. A new work will begun, will begin within them. A work of righteousness, a work, Lord God, of purity, a work that says, I desire more of you, Lord, and less of the world. I desire to honor God, not honor this world. So Lord, it's there at the cross. It's there at the cross that you paid the price. We bless your name, Jesus. We glorify your name, Jesus. We magnify your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for sin, our sin he died, there to my heart was the rejoicing that we are not our own but we have been bought with a price lord we don't belong to ourselves we're not doing works for our own sake but lord we are doing works as unto the lord that you might receive the glory the honor and the praise father i pray that when people in our communities in our schools in our neighborhoods i pray that when people in the grocery store when people on the street, Lord, when they, they see us and they look at our lives, that they would say, man, I want what they have. I want my life to be a reflection of what their life is. And that, Lord, it would lead them into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
Because our life is not simply a life that professes faith, but it is a life that lives faith. It is active. It is working. It is declaring each and every day in our lives that we are living for Jesus. May our communities be changed and transformed. Father, in the years to come, however long it may be, Lord, we don't know the time or the hour when you're going to return. But Lord, whenever that time comes, we want to be ready. And Lord, may it be said of us that they were doing the work of the Lord when he came for them. They were serving the Lord when he came back. Lord, that we would be recognized as a church, as people, Lord, that walk by faith, that live our life to bring you honor and glory. Let it never be said of us that we just give you lip service, but may it always be said of us, man, I, I see their life with works, with action that bring honors to God. So, Lord, go with us now. Keep us safe. Lord, let the, the riches of heaven flow down to us. Lord, because we are honoring to you. We're faithful to you. Lord, we give you the praise and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Go out and live your life daily as an altar is.